In December 1944, strange objects began to appear in the skies above North America, in the town of Thermopolis, Wyoming, at approximately 6.15pm on December 6th. Four miners had just finished their shift at the Bengo coal mine when they saw what appeared to be a large balloon or parachute floating roughly 200 feet overhead. It drifted westwards before disappearing over a nearby ridge. Afterwards, they described hearing a whistling noise followed by the loud boom of an explosion in the distance. Within an hour, the county sheriff had arrived at the scene of the explosion. He discovered scattered debris, metal cylinders, springs and screws but could not determine exactly what had caused the mysterious explosion. Local newspapers reported that the search has been abandoned on supposition that the object seen was a landing flare. No plane was reported as seen or heard on the night the bomb was dropped, but it is said that a plane with that type of bomb could have been flying too high. Nevertheless, the case still remains a mystery. The explosion in Thermopolis was one of the first of many similar incidents reported across the western side of North America. From Alaska to California, people began observing strange objects in the sky, hearing explosions and discovering unusual debris. The American authorities quickly scrambled to understand what these objects were, issuing a directive to all military and police personnel that any balloons discovered should be safely collected and delivered to military intelligence for inspection. The first complete specimens were salvaged from the Pacific Ocean by Navy patrol craft in late 1944. The contraptions they discovered were strange and intricate, consisting of a large balloon measuring 32 feet in diameter, made of a strong four-ply paper. Connected to the balloon were a series of ropes suspending a stack of two wooden boxes, and below these, a cast aluminium wheel with 72 evenly spaced holes drilled into its outer rim. Tied to these holes were a number of sandbags, each weighing between one and three kilos. Crucially, some of the specimens that the authorities recovered, they found a payload of explosives hanging from the bottom of the device, consisting of two 5 kilo thermite incendiary bombs and a single 15 kilo high explosive bomb. The object they had discovered would become known as the balloon bomb. The salvaged balloons were sent to the Aberdeen Military Research Facility in Maryland, where experts concluded that the bombs were of no particular American make, instead matching known characteristics of Japanese bomb manufacture. This was a puzzling realisation. How could Japanese balloons be reaching North America? Military intelligence believed that they were being launched by saboteurs from within the United States or from submarines off the coast. They even suspected that the balloons might be coming from Japanese-American internment camps. The sand in the bags carried on board the balloons was eventually tested by scientists at the US Geological Survey in Washington, who determined that it had come from a very specific location Eastern Honshu, the largest of Japan's three main islands. This provided incontrovertible evidence. The balloon bombs were coming from Japan. To properly understand the role of the balloon bombs in the Japanese war effort, we first need to understand the wider context of the Pacific theater in the Second World War, starting with the Doolittle Raid. High explosive and demolition bombs are made ready for the destruction of military objectives in Japan. On the 18th of April 1942, 16 US bombers, commanded by Colonel Jerry Doolittle, took off from an aircraft carrier deep in the Pacific Ocean and travelled 600 miles to the Japanese mainland, dropping bombs on Tokyo and Yokohama, Kobe and a number of other cities across Japan. The bombings caused a relatively small amount of material damage on the Japanese mainland. However, the psychological impact of the raid was profound. The idea that their homeland could be invaded and their major cities bombed was a massive shock to the Japanese population. Tokyo resident Hatsuyo Sakai wrote afterwards that the bombing of Tokyo and several other cities has brought about a tremendous change in the attitude of our people towards the war. Now things are different. The bombs have been dropped here on our homes. Immediately after the Doolittle raid, Japan wanted to find a way to retaliate. They needed to bomb America. The Japanese Navy was spread too thin in the South Pacific to contemplate a naval invasion, and the Air Force lacked suitable airfields from which they could bomb North America. The Imperial General Headquarters therefore began pursuing less conventional methods to launch a retaliatory strike. Early plans incorporated submarines capable of transporting seaplanes, culminating in the Lookout Air Raids on the 9th of September 1942. 
on a Yokosuka E-14Y1 seaplane launched from a submarine off the western coast of the United States. The plane, piloted by Nabuo Fujita, passed over the southern coast of Oregon and dropped an 80 kilo incendiary bomb on Mount Emily before circling back to the submarine. The bomb started a small fire, but recent rain limited its spread before firefighters arrived to put out the blaze. The attack was the first time in history that the contiguous United States had been bombed by enemy aircraft. Despite its significance, the Lakau air raids failed to inflict any great material or psychological damage. By 1943, all available Japanese submarines had been recalled to assist in the Solomon Islands campaign, rendering large-scale bombardment of the United States by aeroplane impossible. Alternative methods to strike America were being devised at the Noborito Research Institute, a military development laboratory in Kanagawa Prefecture. The institute typically specialised in equipment for espionage and counterintelligence. Secret inks, poisons, pathogens, miniature cameras and counterfeit foreign currencies. Another team within the institute had spent years researching the efficacy and potential military applications of a death ray. Scientists at the institute were therefore no strangers to unusual weaponry, and they used their experience to develop a device capable of reaching the shores of the United States. To do this, they harnessed a secret weapon, wind. In the early 1920s, a Japanese meteorologist called Wasaburo Oishi began studying the wind currents that flew over Japan. On the 2nd of December 1924, he released a single one meter weather balloon from the summit of Mount Tsukaba, 40 miles northeast from downtown Tokyo, with the purpose of tracking the movements of winds in the upper atmosphere. At around 33,000 feet in the air, the balloon made contact with a strong westerly wind, clocking in at 140 knots. With continued research, Oishi deduced that these strong winds were part of a persistent meteorological phenomenon that pushed westerly winds over the Japanese mainland and across the Pacific Ocean. Oishi had discovered the jet stream. Oishi's work received little academic attention and the jet stream remained relatively unknown. This was until nearly two decades later, when the Noborito scientists were searching for a way to bomb the United States. They recognised the military potential presented by the jet stream and, throughout 1943 and 44, conducted further tests which confirmed their suspicions that a trans-Pacific balloon flight was possible. The programme was given the name Fugo, a concatenation of the words Fusen, meaning balloon, and Go, denoting a number or code. However, before their balloons could reach the American mainland, the scientists at Noborito faced a series of challenges. The journey, one of 6,000 miles, would take between 30 and 100 hours, meaning the balloon would experience radical changes in pressure. During the day, sunlight would heat the gas in the balloon to bursting point, while at night the temperatures would plummet, causing the balloon to rapidly lose altitude and drop into the ocean. To counter this, the scientists devised two interlinking systems which could combine to moderate altitude. A gas discharge valve at the base of the balloon to ventilate excess gas at high pressures, and an automatic ballast release system connected to 32 sandbags, which could be dropped to decrease the weight of the balloon. The system was simple. After the balloon had been launched, it would climb to around 38,000 feet. Any excess gas would escape through the discharge valve and the altitude would thereby be maintained. At night, when the balloon dropped to around 30,000 feet, an altimeter would trigger the ballast system, dropping a number of the sandbags to decrease the balloon's weight and prevent any further loss of altitude. This pattern would be repeated over the following days until, when all the sandbags had been depleted, the balloon would release its final deadly cargo. With the design of the balloons finished, manufacture could begin. The Japanese army staff headquarters used industrial firms to produce large sheets of paper made from mulberry wood. These sheets were sent to Japanese schools, where thousands of schoolgirls were conscripted to complete the delicate work of pasting and stitching the balloon envelopes together. Great pains were taken to ensure that the sheets were not punctured. The girls were instructed not to have hairpins, to have closely trimmed fingernails, to wear socks even in the midsummer heat, and to use gloves despite the fact that their work required manual dexterity. By autumn 1944, 10,000 balloons had been prepared, ready for a winter offensive. This was a significant achievement. The scientists at Noborito had harnessed the jet stream 
to create what was effectively the first intercontinental ballistic missile. However, there were serious limitations to this method of delivery. The unpredictability of wind patterns meant that the balloons could not carry out any kind of targeted attacks. It was likely that most would simply end up landing in sparsely populated rural areas, in forests and open fields. Nevertheless, the Noboruto scientists thought that if large-scale forest fires could be started, this could destabilise the American war effort. A single incendiary bomb, containing just a few pounds of thermite and dropped on a dry forest, could conceivably ignite a fire that would spread across thousands of acres if left unchecked. If this was repeated through 10,000 balloons, the campaign could, in theory, inflict massive damage to American infrastructure, spreading fear and panic amongst the general population. Although US military intelligence were convinced that the primary purpose of the balloons was to drop incendiary bombs, other possibilities were nonetheless considered. In March 1945, the War Department prepared a statement listing the potential uses of the balloons. These included number one, bacteriological or chemical warfare, number two, transportation of incendiary and anti-personnel bombs, number three, experiments for unknown purposes, number four, psychological efforts to inspire terror and diversion of forces, number five, transportation of agents, and number six, anti-aircraft devices. In light of the uncertain purposes of the balloon bombs, the American authorities began to develop countermeasures. The first of these, codenamed Project Lightning, would use fighter planes to intercept incoming balloons. Although nearly 500 planes were launched in response to balloon sightings throughout 1945, only two balloons were ever shot down over the North American mainland. One in Calistoga, California on the 23rd of February, and another near Reno on the 22nd of March. The second countermeasure, known as Project Firefly, involved approximately 2,000 troops drawn from the Western Defense Command, along with a number of aircraft, strategically stationed in critical areas to combat large-scale forest fires arising from the incendiary bombs. Despite the military support provided through Project Firefly and Project Lightning, the most powerful tool in the fight against balloon bombing proved to be silence. The first balloon bombing incidents to hit the United States were picked up by local media. However, by January 4th, 1945, the Office of Censorship had issued a request to all newspaper editors and radio broadcasters to refrain from publishing any material related to the balloon bombs. There were two main reasons for this. Firstly, the American authorities wanted to avoid spreading panic amongst the general population. They wondered what psychological response would develop from the realization that the American continent was under sustained enemy air attack for the first time in the history of the United States. What panic might result from the thought that countless silently moving balloons could be drifting across our continent, randomly discharging their bombs into homes and factories. Secondly, the authorities were anxious to deny the Japanese any information that might expedite their efforts. By publishing the location of balloon attacks, the American media would be unwittingly providing data that could be used to refine and improve the balloon bombing campaign. This program of silence worked well. A confidential note from the Office of Censorship to editors in April 1945 commended the cooperation from press and radio, which under this request has been excellent, despite the fact that Japanese free balloons are reaching the United States, Canada and Mexico in increasing numbers. There is no question that your refusal to publish or broadcast information about these balloons has baffled the Japanese, annoyed and hindered them, and has been an important contribution to security. By prohibiting reports pertaining to the balloon bombing campaign, the American authorities were essentially taking a calculated risk. They hoped that the benefits of censorship would outweigh the disadvantages, namely that the general public would not be warned against the dangers of balloon bombing. For most of 1944 going into 1945, this risk seemed justified. Of the total 9,000 or so balloons released from Japan, there were none that caused serious damage to civilian centers, instead falling in open fields and forests where small teams of firefighters were able to keep fires under control. A close call did occur on March 10th, 1945, when a balloon destroyed electrical wires near to Penish, Washington, cutting off power to the Hanford Engineer Works some 30 miles away. The Hanford site was home to a nuclear reactor, used to produce plutonium for the Manhattan Project, the Allied Atomic Bomb Program. This situation was potentially catastrophic. Without power, Hanford's cooling systems would fail, pushing the reactor towards a nuclear meltdown. 
Fortunately, backup generators at the site kicked in successfully, and a potential nuclear disaster was avoided. In a strange twist of fate, the same plutonium produced at Hanford was used in Fat Man. The atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki five months later. Other than the brush with disaster at Hanford, no major incidents related to Japanese balloon bombing were recorded. This was until the 5th of May 1945, when six people were killed by a bomb on the slopes of Gearheart Mountain in Oregon. The group, which consisted of Reverend Archie Mitchell, his wife Elsie, and five children from their Sunday school, had visited the mountain for a picnic. They discovered a balloon spread out on the ground and gathered around it to investigate. One of the children reached down to pick up the device when a large explosion occurred. Archie Mitchell was the only survivor. The six deaths are the only known fatalities on the United States mainland to occur from enemy attack during the Second World War. The incident at Gearheart Mountain caused the American authorities to abandon their policy of censorship. On the 22nd of May, a joint statement was issued by the War and Navy Departments which described the appearance of the balloon bombs and the dangers they presented, warning all members of the public to avoid tampering with any suspicious objects that they might find. Unbeknownst to the Americans, the balloon bombing campaign was already over. Launch sites on the eastern shores of Japan had been damaged in American air raids, and the Japanese Army Staff Headquarters, frustrated by the uncertain results of their efforts, had decided to terminate the program. The last balloons had been launched at the end of April 1945. The balloon bomb occupies a strange place in history. It was a new and radical device, the first intercontinental weapon anticipating the ICBMs of the Cold War. It allowed a foreign power to remotely and consistently bomb the United States, an entirely new proposition which initially shocked and bewildered American military intelligence. Yet, despite its historical significance, the balloon bombing campaign was ultimately a failure. It achieved almost nothing, other than the needless and tragic death of six people, doing little to disrupt or delay the American war effort. As Robert McKesh has written, the effort and expense by the Japanese in the balloon offensive was great in comparison to the minor results achieved. The greatest weakness of the free balloon as a military weapon is that it cannot be controlled. The balloon campaign was an interesting experiment, but it was a military failure. The balloon bombing campaign has since faded into obscurity, another strange and obscure corner of wartime history. Yet, traces of it remain. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Pots of balloons continued to be discovered across North America. As late as 2014, a live bomb from a balloon was uncovered in British Columbia. And a pine tree on Gearheart Mountain still bears pieces of shrapnel from the incident that occurred there. The years since the war have also brought reconciliation, however. In 1962, Nobuo Fujita visited Brookings, Oregon, the town he had firebombed two decades earlier. He brought with him his family's 400-year-old katana, which he gifted to the city as a token of friendship. In 1987, a group of Japanese women who had worked on the balloons as schoolgirls delivered 1,000 paper cranes and handwritten letters to the victims' families as a symbol of condolence. Katsuko Maeda, who worked on the Fugo program as a 16-year-old, wrote, I pray for them from the hills of faraway Japan.